it's a lot of work. It's a lot of energy to put out on that stage and a lot of energy coming back from the audience because it's just, it is, it is like a rock concert and our audiences um, really get into it and they are very responsive and it's just a lot of energy going back and forth and we have about a thousand quick changes running around. Like I said, the dressers are the yeah. heroes of your show. They, they deserve a huge applause because our, sh our show would end after five minutes um, if it wasn't for them. Uh, and it's just, it's a lot of energy and a lot of hard work, um, and it is exhausting, but it is really freaking fun, too. <laughs> but I think Cher set the tone for that, right? So she's been around for six decades, and that's what people have come to expect. If you're going to see the Cher show, you're not looking for a flavor or a genre that's going to be somber or a boutique musical or, you know what I mean? You need the sparkles, you need the flash. So we're trying to check off all those boxes that people who have fallen in love with Cher through the decades can sit there and we hit the expectations, hopefully. And then we add the meat on the bones, which is the humanity and the sort of um, beautiful underbelly of her life well beyond what she also presents on stage. So there is this beautiful balance. All of it comes with a lot of song and dance and shine because that's who Cher is. Like with Cher, more is more, right? And that's what works. You can't just kind of, let's break this down to have a real, you know, dissected musical production. Ain't gonna work. So we feel awesome knowing that we're giving people what they're looking for and hopefully that little extra that perhaps they didn't expect when they walked in the door. Well, I think you are certainly giving that extra as, you know, you're the first share we see when you walk on stage. There are a lot of expectations and building her from almost, I feel like, the outside in. Um, I have to ask because I heard that you found your share voice speaking from the outside in thanks to Crest White Strips. That is correct. Tell me, <laughs> what does your face do with Crest White Strips that makes it sound like Cher? Well, let me first say that we have been a part of this company for almost a year. We have gone out of town. We had an awesome dialect coach. <clears throat> Her name is Kate Wilson. She comes from Juilliard. We worked hard. We spoke through like, you know, paper towel tubes. We tried to do everything to bring the voice of Cher forward. And it really wasn't until I was bleaching my teeth and I was reading the lines. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, oh my God, I think I found Cher. But it really happened that strangely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my husband, it was my husband who first, it perked his ear because he heard me go through, you know, the Scottish accent in Transylvania. Like I, it was a nightmare. And he finally then just said, Stephanie, I think you have it. I was like, what? What do I have? He's like, you sound like Cher. I do? Oh my God, I sound like Cher. I've got it. Oh my God. And then it was pulling them off and finding it without. But it's right. placement. Like, are you holding your muscles in a specific no, way? No, your face? it's finding the placement almost on your upper gum and everything. And it's almost like sobbing. So if you're yawning or crying, let's all do it together. <laughs> if you're yawning or crying, there's kind of a hollow placement that happens back here in the chamber, but all the sound happens. Yeah. yeah, you know, she's, um, there's things that have progressed and transformed in her life, whether she got her teeth fixed or, you know, and that sound has changed a little bit, but once we got it, we got it. I was going to yeah. say, you're not the only one doing it, and you guys maybe didn't have the help of pressed white strips. <laughs> well, once, you guys... she, once she found it, it kind of spread to the rest of us. Okay. I think hearing somebody else besides Cher do it kind of helped us like lift it off the page a little bit. And I used to be like, when we were in Chicago, I'd be like, everyone would be like, do the voice, do the voice, do the voice. And I was like, no, I can only do it when it's on the page. Like in the script, I have to be in the zone. And then all you of a sudden- You can't just like order at Starbucks in your Cher voice. Right, and then we got to New York and I was like, well, I can do it whenever I want. And we found it off the page and it's fine. Like, oh my God, you know? <laughs> You can do it without, um, we just, without the line on the script. Now it sneaks script. in. Like my daughter Vivi will say, no mama, be mama, no share, be mama. <laughs> <laughs> it just kind of sneaks in. What about for you, Tia? And, and just, I mean, and also the three of you forming a character voice, not just the sound of share, but right. what it's like to hear one person through three people. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's tricky because it's three people 
uh, playing one character, and we play her at different times in her life, but the nature of the way the show is structured, it's not necessarily linear, and so we have scenes with each other, we're talking to each other at various times and singing together, and so although we also wanted everybody to believe that we were Cher, and be like, okay, we'll go on this ride with you, we also wanted it to be believable that we could all be one person, and so in addition to finding the share voice, it was also finding things within each other, um, physicality, maybe just sort of like the attack of certain emotions or words or whatever. It's kind of trying to find a balance um, the, of the three of us. Like I, I as a lady, I play the middle share. Um, and there are times where I need to pull on Michaela's babe sort of, uh, uh, isms because it's like here's a little softer, more tender, more hopeful, joyous moment, and then times where I need to pull on Stephanie's star because this is something where I need to like, as Cher says, pull up my big girl pants and uh, you know step up and be a little bit tougher and wiser. And yeah, it was it was a lot of time spent in random rooms with each other um, in rehearsals, just talking to each other, throwing balls, doing weird. I was gonna say, Michaela, you you told me on opening night. Which shout out if any of you watch Playbill's red carpet opening night live, Woo! me company before these guys get there. Um, but you were telling me that it was about finishing each other's sentences as Michaela and Teal and Stephanie, even before it was finishing each other's sentences as Cher and yeah. working with Kate. Well, we had we were lucky because we've been a part of this for a long time, and so our director kind of gave us the patience and like love to find who, like this story as Michaela first. And I think since we were so grounded in who we were, we were able to tell an honest story first and then add the share aspect, which is a huge aspect, but I think we wanted it to be, the goal has always been to tell her story, not do an impression, because there are a thousand people who could do it better than us. So we wanted to do both. And I think since we had the time to do that, we started as us, which was important. You three are not the only people on stage playing someone true to life. All, everyone in the back row as well play, you know, real life characters, which in some cases come down to the voice as well. Matthew, you know, with Greg Allman and Jared, you with Sonny. How did you find those voices? And again, making sure it's not an imitation, but something that you're bringing to the role and to the stage. Take the witcher. <laughs> what is it? Uh, Sonny's tricky away. because he starts out like a caricature. I mean, you know, sort of the Sonny Bono that we know from, especially from Comedy Hour, and even even earlier than that, even in their pop songs, you know, it's so it's so nasal and high and specific, and it, you know, I, I think that that's sort of the danger in uh, doing an imitation of someone specifically like him. So. Uh, I certainly did listen to the songs ad nauseum until, and sang along until I couldn't hear the difference between my voice and, and his voice at, in times. And uh, then I felt like if I could hit that in a couple of moments, then it would give me leeway to, to be not quite exactly like him the rest of the show. And I feel like you must be almost an expert at not doing the imitation, having done Frankie Valli and having done um, Barry over at uh, Beautiful and now doing Sunny. You're the expert on bringing someone to the stage, but not, you know, we're not resurrecting anyone here. Yeah, no, I think I think what they're saying, uh, what the three ladies have said is exactly right. Starting from our, our job as actors doesn't change even when you're playing a real life person. You're still starting with the words on the page and, and doing justice to the author's work. And then, because you're playing a real life person, a lot of your choices are sort of pre-made for you. And so then, okay, so I can't play Frankie with a limp, but I can, you know, <laughs> I have, so I have to do all the things I could when I was, Injured, but like you know, but you have to sort of do you know you have to bring to life the real person that everyone has expectations of seeing. Um, so, and I think a big part of that is hitting a few important pillars like Cher's voice, Sonny's voice. Uh, for me, like the way that Sonny carries himself with his sort of uh, groin forward and the way his sort of like you know loosey goosey arms. It is These very specific. Things, with, this really, yeah. real. And if you hit a couple of those, then you can just do your job as an actor. Say, what is my action in the scene? What does my character want? And go and get it. Matthew, with Greg, I know you were saying that you grew up listening to his music and that that sound was just in your ear. Uh, Greg's singing voice was really easy for me to start with because, like you said, I, I, I grew up playing Allman Brothers. I knew live at Fillmore East and Brothers and Sisters and Eda Peach for, like, I verbatim knew every word. So the sound came really easily. It was the speaking that was harder because once he was a soft-spoken man, he had a very long... Uh, 
Nashville, suburb of Nashville, suburb, suburb of Nashville accent, which is specific. And then it sort of changed over the years when he moved to Macon, Georgia. So it was really difficult for me to get the speech down because it's hard to stay um, uh, like immediate and be right on top of the line and acting on line when you have a slower dialect. So that was the hardest thing for me to kind of find the urgency in what he's got to say. And, but it's hard to sound urgent when there's a guy that's notorious for never really speaking much. And so they said I feel that, like yeah. that's when also the physicality comes in too. There's so, I just feel like he was a, like a palm blowing in the wind the whole time I was watching, right? I think he's, I, I liken him to like a, a blonde Sasquatch. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because one of the, one of the consistent compliment that I've gotten from people that knew him is that, and from Cher too, when she first saw it with uh, Bob Mackey, uh, we were in Chicago, and Bob's like, Cher lost her shit. I was like, what? He said, she was in the back trying not to make a, um, uh, like a, a scene, but when you walked on, she lost it because she's like, he's walking like him. And the only reason I know that uh, he had this um, limp <laughs> is a couple things. Is, uh, he was very lanky, he was tall, and he had this limp because he shot himself in the foot to get out of Nam. So he, so seriously, he had this, here's the great reward. So basically, and it, it works. I love that we're having show and tell. Works with heels, yeah. So basically, this is his arms. So you, first, it's the arms. So the hips are first, and the arms are like this. Yeah. Now, if you add a limp in the left foot, it makes you drop a little bit. So then, this is kind of the slowed down Gregory walk here. <laughs> and then that informs everything. So when you add the hair, the hair starts going. And then you got Gregory. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, Sherry. Sherry is Sherry. These are the jokes, people. It never gets old. <laughs> um, of course, I mean, we've talked about, and there, there's so much out there about all of the research that you all have done, whether it's watching YouTube clips to see these physicalities, old concerts, listening to the records over and over, the Sunny and Cher show, um, Cher's solo show, all of those things. Michael Campigno, because we have two, um, your character is a little bit lesser known. Yeah, it's funny, for uh, somebody who was so stalked by the paparazzi, you can't find a thing on the guy. <laughs> <laughs> I searched very hard to find uh, a lot of uh, research on, on Rob Camilletti, who is a pilot in LA. I just gave that away. He probably doesn't want you to know that. Um, <laughs> he's a pilot in LA, and he flies private planes now, uh, but he's still alive. He was a younger lover of Cher when she was 40. He was about 23, and um, he was just this young guy from Queens, very grounded, uh, salt of the earth, kind of like that. And I, I tried to find so much on this guy, but I found one YouTube clip of him speaking for like five seconds. <laughs> <clears throat> and it was around the time, it was in the 80s too, so it was, it was around the time when there was a lot of paparazzi, MTV did a whole thing on him, and it actually helped me out so much, and I was actually so grateful because I thought a lot of my job was going to be imitating, and um, I thought a lot of people would remember him, but I think what people remember is the essence of him, and the essence of what he allowed Cher to be and become. And um, a lot of people remember the sh the men in Cher's life, and I think a lot of people remember him as like a cute little sexy boy, and uh, there's that. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, 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 it's truly <laughs> that is the end of our uh, talk back. We will see you guys later. Um, no, I think I think uh, it really allowed me to be a lot freer and just focus with Stephanie. And, and it, for me, it was challenging because it was one of the moments of the play that was truly stripped away, and it's just me and Stephanie speaking. And yeah, I, it becomes really grounded when right, your relationship comes to right, the really forefront. Right, really vulnerable in that, but but still stylized, which is so well done by Jason, our director. Um, but it allowed me to really just focus on our relationship and what I can give to Cher and how she can grow from me as a person, as opposed to uh, the imitation of of Rob or playing this young, you know, youthful guy. Yeah. Um, so it actually was a, it was a, uh, something that freed me as an actor. Aside from the things that you were able to research, or in your case, weren't necessarily able to research, I mean, Michaela, you said it earlier, there are, there are a thousand people, theoretically, I don't know if that's true, but you said there's a thousand people that could be doing this. What during is, an impersonation. during an impersonation, during an impersonation, right. So what is the thing that, you found out about Cher, whether it was 
in from the from the page from Rick Ellis' script or from being around her or just from you that you thought this is something I want the audience to see in her and then you know to all of you in your characters. Yeah, she gave us a lot of nuggets of advice along the way. Um, she meaning share yeah. and also Rick <laughs> script as, as you do. You just hang out. It's with like Cher. weirdly casual now. It's not casual. It's not at all. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I think something I always took was she always said one she was painfully shy when she was younger and still is today, um, and two she always knew that she wanted to be famous but had no idea how to get there. And that's just something I kind of keep in my pocket and remind myself before I walk on stage every night because, well, one, I, I can kind of relate to that. I've always known I've wanted to do this and like, you just have no idea how you're gonna do it and then you get to certain rooms in your life and you're like, you just have to rise to the occasion. And that was kind of her journey. She happened to be in Phil Spector's studio and then happened to sing her face off, you know? so. So there's certain markers in her life that um, are laid out kind of beautifully in our story. Um, and I, we've been through so many versions of this script now um, that so many things have been cut. I mean, I remember that my audition sides, we had this great scene on Catalina Island and it was the scene with Sunny and it's not in the show anymore, but um, there was a whole lot of character development or relationship development between us. And I keep those. They are they they may not be seen to the rest of the world, but I played them so many times. So uh, I always love to like look back at those old versions because they're still honest to what we're doing. We just have to tell the story in two and a half hours. But yeah. And we'll definitely talk about more the things that have been cut in that development process. But if anyone else wants to speak to the thing you want to bring out to the forefront in your character, then comes from you. It's, uh, oh God, um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, the thing that I loved about, I, like when I auditioned for this show, um, I didn't really know what, I was like, I don't know what I'm getting into. It's the Cher show, I don't know. I could be anything. And then when I first got the, the audition sides and the scenes that our writer Rick Ellis had written were so grounded in um, base and like, they're, most of my scenes are with Sunny, and they are so true to what real, uh, you know, couples go through. It's it's discussions about work and family and time, and 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 it was just it was all so real and grounded that it was such a great gift. Because I was like, oh my god, you get to play Cher, who is this larger than life creature, and then we also get to show these super real, honest scenes about what she's like at home. And I really try to hold on to all of that stuff because she is, a, she is flesh and blood. She has been through so many ups and downs. And I'm like, what is, what is she like behind closed doors when she's at home, kicks off her shoes, is like walking around barefoot, just sitting, what does she want? What does she want to do? And I just try to remember how grounded all of that felt and kind of keep it going through. Um, because also when being with her, she has this just, there's an ease that she goes through everything. Not an ease because she, she works her butt off, but like she just has such ease in herself and in her body and her, in her physical life. It's comfort. It's, yeah, it's really fascinating. I'm gonna piggyback on her being rooted. And I think if you go to a Cher concert even today or look at her footage, we all remember it as it being a spectacle and high performance. But if you look at Cher, she's the eye of the storm. Everything's happening around her, and she's wearing things that may weigh 30 pounds, dripping with sequins, but she's walking like your neighbor down that stage. She's walking with confidence, but ease and comfortability, and it's very natural to her. And then Bob Mackey said to us, you gotta realize she walks the same way in jeans that she would in a couture gown, and that's what makes her so accessible. So you look up to her because there she is looking like a goddess, but yet she is grounded, and I say this in air quotes, but as normal as any woman could be. And that sort of, um, but being both sides of the coin at the same time is really unique and very rare. And she is that. She's both sides of the coin. 
Michael, you play Bob Mackie, who has been Cher's costume designer, fashion designer, I should say, for years, and designed the costumes for this production. He's someone who, you know, we see in the photos of, with Cher, he's alongside her, whether it's at the Oscars or what have you, but we don't hear a lot from him. We don't know a lot about the personality behind that. So what was it that you wanted to bring to him as a character on the stage and, and him working with you in the fitting room, you know, absorbing pieces of him? Uh, first of all, can we just give it up for Bob Mackey for yes, a second? Yeah. Yeah, Bobby. I think there are over 400 costumes in the show. Over 600 corrected from from There are 400 costume changes. 400 costume changes, 600 costumes. Unbelievable. And I will say, he, uh, Bob will be 80 in March. He is working as hard today as he was in 1975, doing as many clothes as he was every week for both Carol Burnett and for Sunny and Cher Comedy Hour. He's the nicest man in the world. But how many of you ever have seen Bob Mackie talk on camera? <laughs> so, a couple. But, and, but that's basically it. You know, we were talking about Rob Camaletti. People, everyone in the world knows what Bob's garments look like. They know what right, he represents. His creation, right. what comes out of him. But they don't necessarily... really know the man. And um, uh, so for me, I get to play three different, very, very different characters in the show. Bob, Robert Altman, the film director, and also, as I refer to him, the evil Frank, uh, who is a director of the, the uh, Sonny and Cher Comedy Hour and also the Cher Show back in the 70s. But I think the thing about Bob is he's such a humble man. He would never ask for the kind of attention that he affords all of us who are lucky enough to wear his designs. But there is this crazy, thrilling costume parade in the first act of the show. It's where, <laughs> It's everything you want it to be and more. And, and at the very, very end of it, I step down stage center and hit a little pose and the audience goes crazy. And I know perfectly well that it has very little to do with me, but it gives the audience a target for their gratitude. Bob never does that. He never asks for the limelight. He never puts himself out there front and center. So for them to have a play, and I, whenever Bob's in the house, I try to find him, I try to make eye contact with him just so he knows and can really feel that wave of gratitude and love coming from the audience. It's a really, it's a wonderful thing for me to be able to, me, me to, be able to give to Bob. And for me, also, Bob is an incredibly joyful person. And more than anything else, I think that's the single most important thing for me to try to capture about Bob. Well, I think that that's something that came across when I was lucky enough to meet him on opening, that he finds so much joy in the work, that it was exciting for him to recreate so many of these iconic looks, that it was exciting for him to dig out that Oscars gown to recreate one for you, that it was exciting to bring out that original shirt that Sonny Bono wore, and to be able to see that from the audience, you see the joy, not just emanating in your performances, but literally coming off your bodies. You mentioned meeting Cher. When was the first time you met Cher? And when did it shift to like, now I, okay, this is, this is a thing that happens. I, I know Cher a little bit. Does anyone we know that shift ever <laughs> The beautiful thing about Cher is she does, she surrounds, she's fiercely loyal to those who love her. So her best friend, Paulette, has been her best friend for 40 some years, 50 years. Her mother is still alive and is her greatest confidant. Her sister is by her side as her best friend and I believe her manager. Her, her house is tight and close and they protect and love each other and I really honor that. So by no means would I take the liberty, I don't think any of us would, to use the word no. I first met Cher, uh, Halloween of 2017. How was your Halloween 2017? <laughs> so, trick or treat. Went as Cher. <laughs> yes, so it was a rehearsal studio on 42nd Street. Uh, it was a very small, fluorescent lit room where we had to be Cher, for Cher, sitting closer to me than you are right there. And it was um, terrifying and yet very uh, satisfying at the same time. 
because you're presenting a story that you're praying she accepts and loves and can watch for not only entertainment value but also for emotional collateral. And we would, we'd see her tear come down, she'd hold her hand of the person sitting next to her and we knew we had touched on something. Subsequently, we all got a really beautiful, like week long, three days I should say, in Chicago and that was uh, a, next, a next step, right? So now she's coming backstage and she's hugging us and giving us little pieces of information when she's hugging us through whispers. And um, we're getting lots of notes via our script writer and via our director and via our producers of what she would like to see change personally and in the way we're making her be presented on stage and also through the material. Then we get to Broadway rehearsals. She's busy as all get out because that woman doesn't stop. So she's off, you know, promoting. Making that ABBA album, that's amazing. Amazing. So good. Um, and then I would say about two weeks before we open, she shows up and it's it truly is a share intensive workshop. It's through work, it's through personal time. Um, we are, she and now I are now at this beautiful, uh, I don't know what else to call it, but a relationship where, you know, we are speaking to each other via email and um, it's really it's special. Yeah. yeah, well again, you know, there she is seeing her life, she is seeing her loved ones' lives being portrayed up there and she wants to get it right. And who can fault her for that? So even at the 11th hour on opening day, right? So we're about to open our show on December the 3rd. We're still on stage at 3 p.m. rehearsing a new scene with new, that doesn't happen, okay? That really is not the norm for a Broadway show. But Cher's there and Cher says, I need this to happen in order for me to feel comfortable and this living, breathing person to feel comfortable if and when he ever comes see the show. You have to respect that. This is their life that we're presenting. So we do the work to make, her, to make her feel safe, to make her feel proud, and Cher is a truth teller. So if she didn't feel safe, if she didn't feel proud of what we were presenting, she would tell everybody, and that's what we have come to love about her. There is no bullshit with Cher. So there couldn't be bullshit on our stage eight times a week at the Neil Simon Theater. And that didn't happen until 4.30 p.m. on December the 3rd. And that's what we needed to embrace and accept. And here we are. I mean, Chaz just came, um, Chaz Bono came just last weekend, and that was another sort of monumental uh, day for us because, again, I have never met him. I finally did, but the mama bear kind of came out in me, and I said, okay, I know, I know this, all that has been checked off by our writers, producers, directors. I know we are being respectful and loving, but I had to go through again in my head and hit all the places where he is mentioned and how are we doing that and are we respecting his life, his journey, his love of his mama, how are we doing that? And so I don't think that's ever gonna stop. Anytime one of those beautiful, living, breathing people walk through those doors, we're gonna kind of regroup and, and kind of be infused with this, my God, they're all still here, and that we need to portray them in the highest regard. Susie, you're talking so much about how much the show has, has changed. I imagine the biggest change was from Chicago to Broadway, but maybe I'm wrong. You are not wrong. Okay. New show. <laughs> New show. Uh, yeah. I'd say... Okay, so talk, talk to me about... 80%? One, 80%? 80%? 80%? 80 70? That's, that's hard. Okay, how much? <laughs> no, no, no. 80% of the book, but not... The theme has changed. Okay, the family's going to argue a little bit, but <laughs> here's the deal. Some of the scenes may have remained the same, but now they're in a different order. Some of different the people. Oh, characters have been yep. ditched, or that song has been taken from you, given to someone else. It really has been like one of those puzzles where one of the pieces is missed, but you have to move that in order to... Yeah, it's a slide puzzle. Right. And I will She's say right. about 80% of our show changed. Now, did we foresee that? No, we thought it, it, it becomes like an avalanche, right? So you want to just fix that, but that affects that, which right. that affects that. So, right, because you're weaving, a, it's a fabric, oh. making, it's, the threads are 
that quilt is very day. complicated. <laughs> so, yeah, so, and we had two weeks, two and a half weeks of rehearsals in order to do that. So we really rallied and we really believed and we tried to be as resilient as we could because there were days we would get a packet of 40, 50 pages that were going to be different and what including, do you do? Including during previews where, especially the ladies and, and Jared, but all of us, but we would get whole new scenes, new pages, new lyrics, new so songs, what's a new, and they what's were a in that scene? night. Like we would have right, two hours to rehearse them and then you would go into like, the room and cram Michaela, you mentioned the Catalina Island there was this scene, and now that's not there. What's, I, I okay, I'll, I'll give you a good example. Give me, give me. Um, I think we probably went through 35 to 40 versions of our opening number. Yes. So in Chicago, we used to open in Cher's dressing room. She never made it up to the filming of her variety show. She's going in her own head, speaking to what needs to change, what she needs to see happen. So I would step forward in a robe with a Diet Dr. Pepper where every single girl in our ensemble is dressed like Cher and we all speak to the audience at the same time saying, ladies and gentlemen, Cher's. And there's 13 girls looking like Cher staring at the audience. <laughs> Now, I pop on stage wearing the turn back time outfit, right. and we're going full bore what you remember from, you know, the 1980s. I was say, how many people have seen the show? Because, <laughs> because you know that's not how it started at the Neil Simon. We, there's the opening scene, the, the three main, you know, storytelling shares step forward, the three of us, and we're playing cards. Remember we used to like sit down and have a card table and we I were playing Oh really? Do I remember, Teal? Yes, it haunts me to this very <laughs> day. <laughs> we're like, yeah, 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 share in her dressing room. I Dr. used to Pepper. sing a dream is a wish your heart makes on a oh. sewing machine. Well, she made a dress on, or made um, elephant bell bottoms on a sewing that machine. Was, uh, that we was can't even one. have this discussion because there's yes. nothing we would could say. You know, you look at one picture and the other and say, find the ten differences and that. And you can't even begin to explain. Well, then I'll ask to, to the group, Michaela, you mentioned the Catalina scene specifically because it informed, even though it's not there, it really informs deeply this relationship that you have. What's something that's not there in any form anymore, but that stays in your mind? We have um, a continuation of the Catalina scene that went into, uh, we used to sing, uh, all, I wanted, all I really want to do is be friends with you, which has since been cut, because there's just, just how many songs can you put in a show? We had, but uh, Babe and song. Sunny had this long scene in the bedroom where the beds were apart, and then later on they get pushed together, and there's a sort of sequence of, this power dynamic switch when she really wants Sunny, and then he sees her sing for the first time, and then suddenly that's, and then she leaves because her mom, because she had run away from home. I mean, this but it sounds convoluted, but these are all true things. But when you're putting a show together, like how many details can you put in without actually confusing the issue uh, and confusing the audience in, in you know in, in two and a half hours? So that was one. Of, but all of those little bits of the the struggle and the back and forth and and how they ultimately got together and what was so appealing. I mean, from, from my perspective, uh, in, you know, in Cher, in Babe, uh, that remains from that scene. For me, it was actually a stage direction or a description of what it was going to be, and they described Cher as a moth in a cathedral. And so you, how Rick Ellis wrote that one sentence really laid, a, planted a seed for how my Cher was going to be informed for however long I will play this role. That was so beautifully depicted to me, and just this glorious setting, and then this flitting around of ideas and pop music and movies. Like, she is just everywhere, and she doesn't sit in one place for too long, and that to me, I was, it's just, it fueled me in such a way, that one sentence. Well, he's such a gifted writer from Jersey Boys to Peter and the Star Catcher, it's, and it's apparent in this as well. Matthew, you were gonna chime in with something that's still in Oh, about something that's missing? That I, that, I, that I carry with me. Um, it's Michael Fatica um, in the beginning of our show. Uh, he, Michael Fatica is in the ensemble and he's uh, the, like, he's actor, singer, dancer, and like I have a man crush on him because he's so talented. <laughs> but in the beginning of the show, Cher never makes it to like the, the beginning of her concert, and so they're like, we need someone to step in for Cher. And so, so he steps in as a crew guy, and then all of a sudden is just fabulous, and he starts lip syncing her perfectly, and they lift him up and take him in and so. I, I carry that with me. <laughs> I, I, I literally, I totally forgot about that. That was awesome. He's, yeah. I, another thing, there was, um, uh, 
this Michael, used to come in as, at the top when we were in the dressing room and be, he's still the stage manager, Lee the stage manager. He's the unsung hero of our show. Um, he came in and was talking to Star and the, anyways, but the, we had this bumper car line, which I always, I use whenever I'm kind of like trying to justify how we're jumping around from share to share and like what these really quick turns are. It's this chair as she's a bumper car. You know, what was it? I'm a total bumper car dude. I hit a wall and go the other way. Yep. And we're like, we've hit plenty of effing walls. Um, and that that's a line that really informed a lot of just kind of how we're doing the show and, and how we're trading off share and share. And so I keep that. Trading off share and share, we, there's so many of Cher's iconic looks as we were saying. I mean, the whole show, 600 costumes, the amount of quick changes are insane. I think on your vlog, it said something like one costume change average, not actually, but that there's an average of a costume change every 26 seconds throughout a two and a half hour show. Um, what is your favorite one to wear? A, because it's the most fun, and then your favorite one to wear because you feel most like whoever it is you are on that stage. The most fun to wear for me is the mohawk look when she presents the Academy Award. And yeah. why it's so much fun? Because I don't have to do a damn thing. You literally come up from the stage, the people see the top of the horsehair mohawk, the applause happens, and I don't break a sweat, and it's one of the biggest applauses I've ever received in my entire life. Again, thank you, Bob Mackie. Oddly enough, or interestingly enough, when I feel the most share is when I'm in a white t-shirt and jeans and I'm standing yeah. on a strip down stage. Yeah. I just... For audition for Broadway. Correct. Yeah. It doesn't have the bells and whistles, but somehow to me that is the essence of who she truly is. Yeah. Because Cher herself, not just her life story, she was on Broadway, for those of you who don't know. Yep. Super cool. Alright, who else wants to share costume? Uh, I really like because it's also part of the mat. It's really putting like, hey, this is what we're doing in our show. We're doing crazy costume changes, like from one very strong look to a very completely different strong look. And, and it happens on stage. It's right before the big giant Mackie parade. It's, I have this scene with, um, with Michael and with, you know, Mackie and I have this beautiful, this beautiful white beaded gown that we call the under boob dress. And it's just, it's just one of the most gorgeous things that I've ever put on, and it just, ugh. anyways. When you wear a gown that is like bias cut, that has been made just for you by Bob Mackie, and it's covered in thousands of little glass beads that people hand sewn on, it, it you will never experience anything else like that. I've kind of been really People also live at the gym, I imagine. Yeah, and you go to the gym, because it's the under boob dress. It literally is like straps barely covering my nips, and like just, <laughs> like the skirt starts just right where you're like, is that gonna be scandalous? Oh no, there's a skirt, okay. Um, so I go from that, and it's on stage for two seconds, two seconds, and then I turn around and change on stage behind a little mirrored rack with some beautiful, Beautiful, wonderful cast members. Hi, boys. Yes. Hi, boys. 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 Hi, boys
And we were like, yeah, this is it, folks. Like, we found it. Like, this is it. This is amazing. And um, I went in for a fitting for it very last minute because we needed to figure out what I was going to wear in that moment. And he was like, well, we don't really have time to make you something. So um, I pulled a vintage Mackie out. Uh, and we'll see. And we put it on, and I was like, it, it couldn't have fit better. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. I'm wearing like this vintage Mackie like offhand that he like grabbed in his closet. Um, so I'll forever like love that about that dress. But um, yeah. And that's really interesting too, which is not normal. I have a costume fitting next week. We've been, <laughs> open, we've been open for over a month. I still have a costume fitting. There's a few things he wants to change. There are a few pieces that are Mackie originals or things that are shares that I'm wearing on stage. And she wants them back. <laughs> so I've got to go in a day next week. So and what I'm hearing is I need to go back because there's changes in the dialogue, in the costume. Much like share, there's not enough it's share. Always it's always evolving. Yeah, it's always evolving. Uh, I would say my uh, playing Bob Mackie in a Bob Mackie show, my favorite thing that I wear in the show is the Robert Altman look because it is as far from what I look like as I have ever looked like on stage. I have a, like a big paunchy belly and a gray wig and a mustache and beard. And the very, very first time I had that outfit on, we were in tech in Chicago and I was standing out in the house because Altman used to enter from the house. And I saw our production stage manager get on his headset and he glanced over and and, he went, and I saw him talking to somebody, and I turned around and I saw somebody walking down from the Security. back of the theater because they wanted to know who the guy was that wandered in and was just <laughs> standing in the house. It looks like nothing else in the show. Uh, it's truly my favorite thing. Awesome, I love that. Did you have a costume that you wanted to share, Jared, before we... I, I have, actually have, you know, a, a lot of fun costumes. Uh, you know, and it's, there's, there'll never quite be anything like being in a muslin sort of uh, model of a costume and having Bob draw on you and talk about your butt. I mean, you know, that's like those are things that just don't normally happen. But like, do. my favorite costume is actually like when uh, it's this little scene that no one would remember this costume if they saw the show. But I love it because it's it's when Sonny proposes and he's in like a white V-neck cutoff T-shirt and a crappy um, flannel and pants and it's just it's comfortable and sweet Perfect. at home and it's like the, it's transitional. He's got the mustache but he's still got the the long hair and. I don't know, it just feels like that's, maybe in, in terms of their happiness, that might have been I like that one too, Yeah, I love that, I love that costume. I want to talk about, um, <laughs> I want to talk about Sherapy. Yes. Because I think the beauty of this show is that the three of you, it, it, it's not the first time we've seen three actors play a role at three different ages, but instead of, you know, chronologically, we get one and then the other, then the other, the beauty is that you have this dynamic of speaking to each other. And there are moments when we, you know, star share is understanding so much about why she's doing what she's doing because she has the aspirations of babe right next to her, but the comfort of, you know, lady, or, you know, sorry, lady looking to star saying like, oh, I can now know what's coming. Talk to me about just that dynamic and, and the power in that, and if you feel, you know, do you feel like you fall into those categories? Well, I think it's very human to talk to ourselves, whether it's through the course of an event or the, during the course of a day. You know, you look in the mirror and you go, you got this girl, or, you know, oh my God, I'm so exhausted. Just during the course of the day, you're constantly having a conversation with yourself. Those of you who enjoy therapy, as I do, um, <laughs> yesterday, truly, I mean, my yes. therapist would say multiple times, you need to put Stephanie, 12-year-old Stephanie in that chair, and 5-year-old Stephanie needs to sit there, 21 Stephanie needs to sit there. Those two need to be quiet, and now you need to address her, and we've got to deal with, you know, the crap that happened there. That's where Sherapy came from. Um, and it really is kind of remarkable that we do get to have this sisterhood. We can coach each other. We can talk each other off the ledge, literally. We can scold, lovingly scold, and say, why aren't you learning the lesson? Why aren't you being stronger at this moment? And I love it. I gotta be honest, that was, there are a lot of things about this project that intrigued me, but when Jason Moore, our director, sat down and said, here's the spiritual, 
story I want to tell about sisterhood, about elevating yourself to your best self, that's what hooked me. That's what made me. <laughs> They're all down. They're all down. You have a show tonight. such a, a big journey of a show because it's shares life from how old are you when you start like six, like yeah yeah like first grade to to mid 50s where we like leave off to try to tell that whole story um and to have three women be the center of that and really use each other it's just a really great way to come into work and be like i get to share this story with these gals and there are times because life does imitate art and we're putting on a big beast of a show and there are times where we're exhausted or we're sad or like life something weird in life happened and you're like oh my god I, how do i put that behind and not have it come out on stage and we get to look at each other in the eyes and honestly be a support system and yeah there's a moment in the show when we sing song for the lonely which is the act one sort of closer we the three of us come together and look each other in the eyes, and there are so many moments where we are literally singing to each other. I am singing to Stephanie, Michaela. I need Michaela's voice to sing to me, and I'm like, oh my God, this girl. Ah. It's, it's really wonderful. It's such a gift, and I'm so thankful that we get to do this. And yes, okay. Aside from their, well, okay. yes. Aside from, um, you guys having your bonding moments as the shares, do you all talk about what it was that, you know, the through line of these three men who were in love with this one woman, this other man who was a huge partner in a different way in their life, do you guys ever powwow about that? As like a group of the guys who... We, I, I, we haven't powwowed about it, but I think just, uh, for me personally, um, Sunny is such an integral part of the story, and then when my character comes into the frame, um, there's such a juxtaposition, there's such a drastic um, difference. So I, I, I like, there's a lot of things that I um, have chosen to do that I, I, that I specifically want to be stark different from things that Sunny is doing on stage, that Jared has chosen to do, because uh, it was a point in her life where um, she needed something completely different. There was something completely different. It was somebody who was a little bit younger, someone who was um, not restrictive, uh, someone who was very, very go with the flow. Who was very, um, he was like a uh, in the beginning, like a like a human, like lovable blanket that just wanted to just smother and love her. Um, and not that Sunny did neither, but you know they had gone through some difficult things. So to answer your question, no, we haven't powwowed, but I've have been taking a lot of cues um, dramatically off of uh, what precedes me. Michael, you were telling me on opening night a little bit about what it's like to play Rob in terms of, you know, you talking about, Matthew, you talking about the contrast of it, how you feel like you're in contrast to almost the whole mechanism of the show, that things just shift once that relationship enters. Yeah, it's, I think what the Share Show got so right, especially from Chicago to New York, is they just found its style. And I, I'm, I'm listening so intently here, and I'm, I'm having epiphanies right now, but it's so true, and it's, it, it, it's relatable to when you meet Share. Like, when you meet Share, like Stephanie was talking about, you're almost like backing off because she is such a huge thing and you just get sucked in more and more and more and get stripped away and she's still the same person. And um, yeah, I, 
I feel like now you just spend a night with Cher. Even the, the Camelletti stuff is so different now. Uh, we we met in a club in Chicago, and then we uh, I helped her with Moonstruck, the script, and uh, then we went to the Oscars together, and she won her Oscar. Um, and now it's more stylized, where we start out in the music video for I Found Someone, and we it's the same essence of it. It's just different. Uh, text, right? And and like you're saying, like you don't need all that text to endow all of that stuff. And uh, Cher came into my dressing room to talk to me about Rob, just me and her. I was sweating, she looked beautiful. <laughs> and uh, I was like, do you want to sit down? She was like, no. And I was like, I'll sit down. And so I sat down. And she stood there. And um, like Stephanie was saying, there's just so, it just gets deeper and deeper. There's so many directors who are just like, Go deeper, go deeper. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. But I get it now because it just, it means so much more. And I think that's what we're finding now. So, um, yeah, my, my personal relationship, it was a challenge for me, uh, especially I'm, I'm 28. And, um, <laughs> and I am actually a huge fangirl of Stephanie J. Block. So. <laughs> I found out I got the job and I was like, who's Cher? Oh, you're kidding, Snappy J Block. <laughs> I freaked out a little bit. So my challenge was, um, the, the notes that I kept getting from Cher and the directors is, is Rob so grounded, he was the adult in the relationship, right? And, and I feel like a little fangirl with Snappy J Block, so my work was, was really finding my power and my strength, and, and Rob actually helped me, Michael, find so much groundedness in, in my confidence that I'm the youngest of six, so I'm, I'm usually just like grasping for people, but uh, this, this job has, has really helped. She raised her hand. We were gonna... But I have to say, by, by the end of this beautiful marathon, and he and I finally get to share the stage, and it is you and I for a good chunk, he's physically holding me up, he is silently with his eyes holding me up, there is... You are a great um, center for me, and there are times where I am very tired, and this one is taking the brunt and leading me along, and I will screw up lines left and right, and he's wi You know I make stuff up. You know I do. Sorry, Rick Ellis, but by the end, I'm just like, hamana, 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 hamana. And he's with me, and it is really a flow that changes, but you are the adult by the end of that play, so. Thank you. You guys got that on camera? So yeah. We actually had a question from Twitter, from um, Allie on Twitter, who wanted to know about keeping yourself intact through such a strenuous show. How do you preserve the voice? How do you preserve yourself emotionally? Especially, you know, doing someone else's voice. I'll take this one. I'm in 23 minutes of the show, so it's really... Ready, girls? One, two, three. Fuck you! <laughs> Love you. I think I'm still trying to figure it out. I'll be really, really honest. Um, I've been blessed that I know what big shows feel like and big roles feel like. This feels different in the sense that it is really an emotional go because we do start at six, we end really present day. You say 54, but really we end where she's in her 60s and we've lived through a lot. And that last chunk is very emotional. And I do find myself breaking down every show. It doesn't have to be fabricated because the exhaustion is real. The backstage life is very physical as well. If you saw the choreography, I know we keep going back to that, but it, it, unlike a lot of shows where you can sit in one costume and wait for your next entrance and then put on some like, you know, comfortable haracha shoes, this is not what this is. As soon as I'm off stage or any of us are off stage, we're running to the next costume change. I, I laugh, but at one change, I've got eight people, and they're saying, wig, check, dress, check, shoes, check, arm, check, Oscar, check, go, and it, it is Oscar a thing. Check. It's a real thing. So I'm still trying to find that balance. I'll be real honest. I, I sleep as much as I can. Um, there is no, hey guys, let's party. <laughs> Not for this girl anyway. I mean, I would love to with this company. They're exquisite people. I wish I could hang with them, but you know, as a wife, a mama, and wanting to do the best I can on stage as long as I can, it is a true balance, and 
it sounds silly, but this one is very athletic in the sense that, you know, my wig weighs four pounds. I wear wings that are 25 pounds. At any given moment, we're, we're hiking around with an extra 40, 50 pounds on our back. So, um, she tired. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even talk about the choreography, both backstage and onstage from Chris Kelly. I mean, Michaela, you're kicking your face. This kick ensemble face. is living. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> on this note, I think one of the biggest lessons I learned from the chair show was about a woman coming into her power and was seeing how much she fought. You know, we think of Sunny and Cher and, you know, not just the early years when she was fighting, but that she was so successful alongside him. And I learned that that was not, um, hate to say it, but it was not shared. <laughs> it wasn't. It was, um, her name was on it, but she was not earning what she had rightfully been entitled to. And that line about, I've been fighting all my life, just, I mean, hit me to my core. So we'll leave on the note of what is it like to play the woman coming into her power, to be around this story of a woman coming into her power, and then how has that empowered you? I feel that saying coming into her power is very interesting. I feel that she's hit her power many times, and somehow the world, as it has a way of doing, wants to strip anyone who has found their power of their power. She has never allowed that to happen. The outside eyes can say, wow, she's not at her most successful. That doesn't mean she's lost her power. I feel her power always comes from I'm coming back, and I'm doing this for my family, I'm doing this for my fans, something happens, she comes right back, I'm doing this for myself, I'm doing, and it's a beautiful, beautiful, complex story because she is the most resilient, she never gives up, and one of the final lines of the show is, you win some, you learn some. And that woman is still open to, to learn. And as silly as it sounds, she puts her voice out there for social issues, artistic issues, human rights. And every now and then, she may trip on a word, and she's the first to say, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say it in that way. And that, to me, is what makes her so powerful, is that we get to see the flaws and the stumbles and the being stripped of your power, and yet this woman is not gonna stop because she decides when she gets to stop. I don't know if there's anything to add to that, but if you want to, have at it. Before you guys go, there's a share themed photo booth with two cast members, Mikey and Blaine, a floor above us. So go partake in, uh, there's probably wigs, right? There has to be wigs. There are ways to find it. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, you can look at some of the fun that we have backstage um, on the Insta stories. I'm at Ruby Piersberg on Instagram. Follow them on Twitter and Instagram at The Share Show. And be sure to go see The Share Show at the Neil Simon Theater on Broadway. Woo!